Well, hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Masley, and we're posting up a live Facebook session tonight, and I've actually already received a bunch of questions. So I'll try to bounce back and forth between questions that we received um, by email and those that show up live. Um, Hi, Adam. Glad you're here. Um, so I've got some already, as I just said, I already have some questions we've reached by email. I'd love for you to post yours as you get, um, as we go along. And I just, I'm going to let a few more people show up. So let me start um, just with some of these questions that emailed in, and then I'm going to come back to Adam and others in just a moment. So um, I'm going to start with food because that's one of my favorite talkies. So we've got heart and cholesterol questions, food questions, supplements, exercise. Let me start with some. Um, well, I'll change it. I'm going to take um, Adam's question first because he's the first one here. What are my thoughts on metformin? So metformin is a medication that's used to help. Generally, we use it to help decrease blood sugars. And it's been around for many years. It's actually pretty safe. Um, we especially i tend to think of if your fasting blood sugar is more than 110 and you've tried your best yeah that's the big question you've tried your best to get it down and it stays above that uh, i think most standard doctors probably wait till your blood sugar is over 126 i usually start at 110 milligrams per deciliter and if it's more than that i think of using it to decrease blood sugar but i i always prefer to use lifestyle first you know are you eating the right foods have you increased your fiber? Have you cut down on your glycemic load? Do you get enough exercise? Do you get enough sleep? Do you meet your nutrient needs? I'd do all that before I thought of metformin. And if we did all those things and they weren't working, or you couldn't make those changes for whatever reasons going on in your life, then I think it's a useful medication. I mean, the most common side effect is probably gastrointestinal distress, diarrhea. Most people tolerate it pretty well, though. Uh, you can't take it if you've got renal or kidney disease. You know, if you've got bad kidney liver disease, then that impacts how you re metabolize and remove it. So that'd be a contraindication. So I think it, a side effect also is that it helps a little bit with weight loss. So probably people who are using that medication, are it's going to help them make their insulin more sensitive. It actually helps reverse insulin resistance. So the action of the drug I like, I mean, some things like, lower a, a number, but they don't have any health benefit. Improving insulin resist, in, improving insulin sensitivity and getting and decreasing insulin resistance is a good idea. So Adam, um, if you're wondering about that med, my goal is that you wouldn't need it. But if you do have blood sugars more than 110 and you've tried everything and they're not working, I think you should talk to your doctor about it. Just be aware of those side effects and it could help you even lose a couple pounds. So um, not such a bad thing. And hi, Carrie, I am glad you're here too. Thank you for tuning in. Um, now, um, oh, and if anybody, so if, if this is, if I say something useful, if this is helpful, please feel free to pop up an emoji that you like it. Um, there you go, or that, <laughs> that would be great. And Julie, um, you're here too. Um, You've been on metformin for 18 years. So yeah, it can definitely be helpful there. Um, it does, Carrie's asking if licorice um, in GI fortify it, enough to cause a negative effect on kidneys. Licorice, I tend to think of people using licorice like for heartburn or some gastric, gastrointestinal issues. I, I doubt in a modest dose it would have any effect on your kidneys. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, and then I and then I'll take one more. I'll take Julie's question here on how do you get off metformin? Well, as I started off saying, before I ever put someone on metformin, I want to make sure they're like following the better brain solution eating plan. 
that you're really following a low glycemic load. We've cut out the sugar, flour, potatoes, corn, and mostly you're eating really clean protein, vegetable fruit, beans and nuts, um, using olive oil, healthy cooking fats, you're using lots of spices and herbs, you're active. I would say 90% of my patients who follow my plan and need metformin for high blood sugar don't need it anymore. So in, I've helped thousands of people with elevated blood sugar uh, not have normal blood sugar and not need any medication. So Julie, I really think you could do this. Um, Couple questions on the food subjects I got. What about beet juice powder? Well, beets are fantastic food. I would actually prefer you eat beets, but if you don't like beets and you wanna get the benefit, uh, okay, you could do that. I've given you several recipes over time on how to use beets. You can grate them in a salad. You can roast them in the oven. You can boil them and slice them. Uh, beets are awesome. They in that reddish purple pigment in beets, improves blood supply. It's really good for your circulation. So please eat them. Uh, when you juice them, you get, without the fiber, you get too much juice, but they can extract the sugar from the juice, take it out, dehydrate it, and make beet juice powder. Okay, when they take the sugar out, you gotta check and make sure it's sugar, reduced sugar, sugar-free. But when they take that out, that's an awesome supplement. It's a little pricey, but you'll find now that Olympic athletes are using it big time because if you can improve your circulation 10% in an endurance athlete event, wow, that's a huge advantage. And when you think about it, um, any of those bead extracts, if they're improving circulation, they help men's erectile function. They help athletes. They've improved blood, slide, um, blood supply to your brain. So beet powder, it's awesome. I'd prefer eating beets regularly, but if you're not a beet fan, um, that beet powder can be really good. So, um, and, um, I, so Martin, that's a really good point. Yes to beet powder, um, even better yes to adding more beets. Um, here's a question on using um, C8 uh, oils. Um, that's that eight carbon MCT oil that you can use. So James wants to know about putting in a smoothie. Well, you certainly can. I mean, so who benefits the most from using MCT oil? That would be like the question I should try to address here. MCT oil, those C8 oils are derived from like coconut oil or palm oil. They pull them out and they select a certain type of fat that's in that oil. And that fat in clinical studies has helped them show, take people with mild cognitive impairment and make their brain function better, make them sharper, quicker, more productive. So uh, it, uh, unfortunately, it was not that effective for people with the ApoE4 gene, but for the rest of the population, the other 80% of people, it does seem to have some slight benefit in converting mild impairment to uh, better brain function. I've never seen a study that makes normal people sharper though. So. There's many claims out there. I'm sure you've heard about them. Some of my colleagues who I like and our friends have made those claims, um, but there's no published research out there showing it works for everyone. So I'm not suggesting everybody has to go out and buy um, C8, this middle specific medium chain triglyceride, but you could, and if you benefit from it, then I think that's great. So I think it's certainly a healthy fat and okay for you to use, James. So. You also asked about goat cheese, goat yogurt, beef jerky. I mean, goat dairy products seem to be a little less allergic, inflammatory than dairy. Not everybody has to avoid dairy, but if dairy bothers you, goat is one option you can try. So I think that's okay. I always wanna make sure if you use any dairy product that's organic. To me, that's, I don't really like the hormones they give to cows to enhance milk production that seem associated with cancer. So I'd make sure it's organic, whether it's goat or cow's milk. And if you're dairy intolerant, you could try goat milk. I find actually many people who are cow dairy intolerant or goat dairy intolerant too. Camel milk, I'm gonna write a blog sometime in the next few months about camel milk because it even seems less allergenic and has more health benefits. So I'll, I'll come back and come up with, talk to you about camel milk later. I think it's pretty cool. And then you asked about beef jerky. Well, I'm fine with beef jerky as long as you're making sure it's organically raised, grass fed, they're not 
putting it in a feedlot and feeding it corn, which gives it an inflammatory fat, and they're not doing other things to it. So um, James from Santa Rosa, there you go. There's your questions. Let me take a peek up here and see. Um, from Avril. So Julie asked about metformin. Um, we talked about getting off it. How did, um, I think, Avril, you're saying does, you're, are you on, twin nista, why does it make me tired? Um, can you rewrite that question? I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know what twin nista is, um, Avril. So if you could maybe respond, clarify that for me, that would be really helpful. Um, okay. Next question. What about on supplements? What about fats? Like, you know, in, instead of using fish oil or DHEA, how about, you know, can you just eat more fat from food? And the answer is yes, as long as they're smart fats. So um, I don't have a name for who posted this, but is higher fat in particular, and but what about saturated fat? Can I eat more saturated fat? I don't think saturated fats are going to, my bias is it doesn't add any benefit. This is one of the probably the most controversial areas in healthcare and nutrition today about whether you should be adding more saturated fat or not. As long as they're clean, they're organic pasture raised, they didn't raise them in a feedlot, they didn't give them hormones, pesticides, they didn't feed them corn and GMO soy, if they have, if they skip doing that and they leave them clean, I think they're at least neutral and they're probably fairly harmless. I'll say that. And at least in a moderate dose, I don't have any concerns about it. Um, the big question is when you're adding saturated fat that comes from fatty dairy and fatty meats, are they clean? Um, if that's the case, I'd say neutral. The other fats that you should eat more of that are really good for you would be from like sea, seafood, whether it's seaweed if you're vegetarian, or fish, you know, especially cold water sources like wild salmon, sardines. Those are great for your brain, your heart, lowering inflammation. Um, nuts, avocado, uh, those are, you know, dark chocolate. Those are going to be some of my favorite fats out there today. So, um, yes, I would like you to eat more fat. And, um, yes, you could even use a supplement like um, fish oil. If you're vegetarian, like DHA, that comes from seaweed, up to 500 milligrams a day. And if you're um, open to eating fish or getting fish supplement products, then I'd say a thousand milligrams of EPA and DHA each day. Um, here's, uh, I don't know who, the, this is from Joan. How much magnesium should a 77-year-old woman take how about B12? Uh, well, I'll answer both of those. So, Joan, magnesium, I want everybody to get at least 400 milligrams a day. And if you look in the Better Brain or um, Smart Fat book or Heart Tuna book, it gives you a table on how much magnesium you get from food. So figure out how much you get from food. The average person's only getting about 200 milligrams, half of the RDA. And ideally, you should get 600, maybe 800 milligrams of magnesium every day. Um, so look for it in food. And then um, why do I recommend taking it right before you go to bed? Because magnesium does several things. It lowers blood pressure, it improves blood sugar control, it decreases muscle cramps, it helps prevent constipation, it helps fight off and um, prevent migraine headaches, but it also helps you relax and go to sleep. And for people who have insomnia, oftentimes they're magnesium deficient. So if you have any issues with um, falling asleep, staying asleep, being restful, being calm, I usually suggest, that's why I suggest in magnesium, if you're taking a supplement, you take it at bedtime and you get that extra rest benefit with it. Um, next up from Ryan, I have, what about L-theanine um, for those of us who don't drink matcha tea? Could you? And as a, as a supplement question, should it be taken with coffee to get some caffeine with it? Well, theanine, let's talk about that. Theanine is the compound that you get from matcha tea. You get from all tea, but matcha tea, this special tea that's grown, one, in the shade, and two, it's pulverized into powder. So you absorb a lot more theanine from the tea than if you just dip in the tea bag and throw the tea bag away, you miss a lot of the theanine. And I'm not suggesting you need to eat the tea bag because I'd rather you get matcha tea. It tastes better. It's usually organic. 
and that growing in the shade has a benefit too. So theanine is a compound that comes from shade grown teas where you pulverize it and it helps you be calm and focused. So as an example, Buddhist monks have been drinking it for about 2000 years when they meditate to help them focus. So that's a really nice thing. And you know, so it's really helpful for you. And when, in studies that we've done in the US, we've noticed that in people who have more theanine, they can focus better, they can concentrate better. Now, caffeine also improves your ability to focus and problem solve, but some people are caffeine sensitive. So if you really wanted the maximum brain benefit, yes, you would combine caffeine and theanine. But if you're caffeine sensitive, then I mean, clearly it's not worth it. So people who are trying to avoid caffeine, I think there is a benefit to theanine. Uh, you could get it from drinking four to eight cups of matcha tea a day. Um, the, ben the amount that's been shown in studies really to work and improve your brain function. And that's been my, over the last few months, um, I've been drinking matcha tea in the morning. I, I may, I've drank coffee almost every day for 45 years and loved it and still like it, but it gives me heartburn. <laughs> and I finally, uh, I finally broke down and said, okay, enough's enough. If I have to take an antacid or something because of my heartburn after a cup of coffee, I shouldn't be drinking it. So I switched to matcha tea and my heartburn's gone away. I'm thankful to say with that, it really did help and make a difference. So um, matcha tea does not have that same effect that coffee does, but, and it does have caffeine. It has about 30 milligrams. You can get, you can look for decaf sources that are decaffeinated and take the caffeine out. I think the biggest benefit is having matcha tea by itself. Again, you need about four cups a day. Um, if you were trying to avoid matcha tea, let's say perhaps you don't like it, Ryan, then you could have a cup of coffee and take a pill, but you'd need about 60 to 80 milligrams of a theanine pill and L-theanine, and you could do that. So I think that was really what you're trying to figure out. Um, perhaps you didn't say it, but perhaps you don't like matcha green tea. You like coffee. You could have it decaf or you could um, take a theanine pill. So, all right, I think I covered your question there. Let's look back up on the board here and see what we have. Um, I'm gonna slide up so I don't miss somebody. Okay, uh, Mariana, um, welcome. Oh, um, Avril is pointing out that what she was asking about a blood pressure tablet. Okay, let me go back up to your question here. Twist it doesn't make me feel tired. Uh, some blood pressure tablets can make you, they can drop your blood pressure. So here would be some good news. If you're on blood pressure medication and you follow my Better Brain program or my Heart Tune Up program, you're eating better food, you meet your nutrient needs, you add more activity, you manage your stress, your blood pressure drops. And oftentimes, if that happens, you're going to be tired. Many blood pressure meds, the side effect is um, fatigue when you're on them. So the healthier you are, the less likely you need the medication, and the more likely you control your blood pressure off these drugs. So my goal always with my patients is if you're on blood pressure meds, let's help you make changes to your life, the right food, to get the right nutrients like magnesium and potassium, and add activity and manage your stress, and hopefully you wouldn't need those pills anymore. So yes, commonly blood pressure meds can make you tired. That's not surprising. And please make sure if you're following my program that your blood pressure hasn't dropped because that would even make it worse. You could even get dizzy. But that should be a sign. Talk to your doctor about stopping your med or an alternative to that. So that's pretty common. Um, Mahela, hello. Hello, Mahela. Glad to be here. So Carrie has a question. DHA from algae for kids. That's just um, omega-3s, correct? Um, should we look for a good omega-6 source also? Well, Carrie, most people get plenty of omega-6. It's in food. It's in nuts. Um, the average person gets 20 parts of omega-6 fat and only gets one part of omega-3. Ideally, if you ate the ideal food, like only grass-fed animal protein, um, you ate seaweed and seafood, and you ate nuts and seeds, you'd be getting a 
one to one or four to one omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, but most Americans are at 20 to one because they're eating too many grains and they're eating refined products and omega-6s are all over out there. So I have yet to ever meet someone who needed omega-6s. So the good news is usually you don't have to add them. People get plenty. And so I would just look at omega-3. And uh, one advantage of DHA for kids is it doesn't have a, really a fishy taste, at least not to me and not the brands I've tried. So, uh, but there are um, some, like Nordic Natural has these jelly um, omega, omega-3, long chain omega-3s, omega, -3s, omega um, EPA, DHA. They taste like um, really good. So you can get omega-3 supplements for kids. You can also get DHA supplements for kids. Um, for children, I usually use those flavored ones from Nordic Natural, to be honest. And But now Designs for Health also has a liquid that's really delicious. Um, omega-3, um, long chain, EPA, DHA chain. And with that, if you're willing to do like a spoonful of their liquid, they've got orange, um, key lime, and mango. Um, all of those are really nice, and they taste pretty good. So if you can get a child to just do like a – half a teaspoon a day, um, okay, you just made their omega-3 need. Um, and if they're vegetarian, then yes, you should be looking for just a DHA supplement um, that comes from algae. All right. Jennifer, what are your thoughts on probiotic brands and, many, and any brands you tend to recommend? Um, so Jennifer, yes, your gut has hundreds of trillions of bacteria in it that keep you healthy. It lowers your inflammation. It processes and removes toxins. Um, it helps you function better. And if you grow the wrong bacteria in your gut, you, you actually get more inflamed. You, your gut's inflamed. You can have GI distress. Um, it, they, create, they create a compound that makes you hungry. Now, this is kind of amazing to think that gut bacteria are somehow smart enough or evolutionary evolved enough that they've figured out if they can learn how to produce propionic acid, a chemical compound that goes from your gut to your blood to your brain that stimulates cravings for you to eat sugar and flour, refined foods, which feeds the Firmicutes bacteria. So you make more propionic acid, you have more cravings and you gain weight and then you make more of these bad bacteria. So I want you to have good guys growing in your gut, not the bad ones. And so, yes, they really do tend to impact your health, um, even your heart. You know, they impact your brain, your memory. But I think the latest data is most of the risk factors that are associated with heart disease and memory loss are adversely affected by the wrong bacteria in your gut. And the right bacteria make a difference. So I do recommend everybody should be eating fiber every day, vegetable, fruit, beans, and nuts, because that's what your good bacteria need to eat. Your bad bacteria wants you to eat sugar and flour. That feeds the bad guys. The good guys want vegetable, fruit, beans, and nuts. Um, they don't want flour. They don't want fiber from flour because it's got it raises your blood sugar. And it's the wrong pattern. So more vegetable and fruit. Um, that's pretty amazing for that. That you can also use probiotic foods like sauerkraut or kefir or yogurt. Um, Miso, there's so many out there, Natto. You can make your own even for that matter. So probiotic foods. And if you've ever had GI distress or if you have GI issues, um, I would even do a bigger boost. Like you might get 5 billion bacteria per serving with yogurt but, or, or kefir, um, but you're probably, you can get 25 billion with a pill. So the brands I probably use the most would be either um, Claire Labs or Designs for Health. Those are the um, probiotic sources I use most often. I think they're really good quality and I um, know the people who make them. So I trust them and I, and I follow up on them and I really do a lot of research on this. And coming soon, um, there's going to be a, a brand, there's going to be a grouping of probiotic bacteria that have been shown in studies to help with weight loss. So a specific combination of five to six probiotic bacteria, they're going to help put the right guys in your gut to help you lose weight. And that's going to be um, launching sometime probably by end of the summer. That's really an exciting um, um, something coming up. And I'm going to be sending a blog out that I anticipate on this sometime in the next one to two months and letting you know about a new combo. So 
those are my thoughts on probiotic and brands that I would recommend. Um, Adam, you wanted to ask about farm-raised salmon versus wild. Um, farm-raised products say no mercury. Uh, uh, let me let me try that. So, farm-raised salmon versus wild. Farm-raised, it's really hard to know what they've fed them. Um, you could try to find out, like if they're really using just herring, they caught like there's some organically raised uh, salmon that are produced down in Chile now, where they go out and catch herring in nets, and that's what they feed the salmon, and they're not using antibiotics and drugs on them, and that's pretty healthy, but how do you find those fish in the store? That's really difficult to know where they came from and how they were raised, and um, that's a challenge. The big thing is there's more chemicals. They're, using, they're feeding them corn that's got pesticides on it, and animal products that have um, dioxins and other really toxic compounds and PCBs in them. So we know that farm-raised fish have much more toxic compound per serving and not as much omega-3. And, um, and oftentimes when they raise them in these cages, they're using chemicals because of the environment they're in to keep them healthy. So I always prefer wild over farm-raised, unless it's some special farm that's really exclusive and hard to find. So um, not only so nutritionally they're better and they're clearly cleaner and it's better for the planet as well because you know farm-raised fish, they, they get loose, they can be genetically modified. Um, there's a whole host of issues with that, let alone on the pests they grow on them in these farms like sea lice. So when you can choose Aim really aim to choose um, wild over farm raised, even if it's more expensive, just have a smaller portion and enjoy it. It probably tastes better too. Now, mercury, mercury is in really, it's throughout the ocean. You know, we're burning tons of coal planet wide. It filters down in the atmosphere into the water and that once it hits the water, it gets into the plankton, it's in the food supply. And the higher you go on the food supply, the higher the mercury levels are. So for example, plankton has really almost, it's there, but you could eat a lot of plankton, it's not gonna impact you. When you go a step higher to shrimp, still really minimal, trace amounts. When you get to even herring and sardines, really tiny amounts. Um, who eats um, herring and shrimp? Well, that would be like a salmon. A salmon's still not that high because they're eating relatively low on the food chain. So small levels in salmon. Let's go, but let's think of a fish with a bigger mouth, like a grouper or a tuna or a bass or a big snapper. Those are eating higher on, they're eating small fish, small to medium sized fish. That, that's a big, that's an exponential jump, jump of more mercury. And once we get to things like big size tuna, um, kingfish, swordfish, shark, I mean, your mercury levels are almost off the chart. So it goes up exponentially the, the longer a fish lives. So a 10-year-old, 20-year-old fish has a lot more mercury than a two-year-old fish like a salmon. And um, the bigger the mouth, the higher it. So that's why we're always looking for things like salmon, sole, flounder, um, sardines, or seaweed if you're vegetarian to get low mercury sources. And the things you want to avoid for mercury would be shark, swordfish, tuna, grouper, snapper, um, those bass, those are all much higher. It's not, the mercury content is not necessarily related to wild or farm raised. Unless they're, sometimes they'll take like the shrimp bottom catch with all these fish at the bottom of the ocean when they're dra dragging for shrimp and they grind them up and feed them to the salmon. Well, in that case, that farm raised salmon if that's what they're being fed, could have high mercury levels. So you'd have to watch out. Okay. Um, Kathy has a question about vitamin K2. What about vitamin K2? Well, let's go back a step. What about vitamin K? Vitamin K is really good for your health. Um, we um, K as in the German word coagulation, stop you from bleeding. Um, and coagulation in German is spelled with a K. So vitamin K, we know it helps stop bleeding. Um, very, almost everybody gets enough vitamin K that that's not an issue. So what we need more vitamin K for is both your, your bones and your arteries. 
If you don't have vitamin K, here's what happens to your bones. They release calcium, it goes into your bloodstream, and your arteries can't keep it out, and they get calcified, and that doesn't sound good. So if you're not meeting your needs for vitamin K, you're likely to lose bone mass and calcify your arteries. You end up with hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and a hip fracture, really bad. So everybody should be getting vitamin K, and there's two primary sources. There's K1, that comes from vegetable foods like green leafies, like kale and um, spinach. Um, any green leafies got vitamin K in it. And it, you, would you like, if you got a cup a day of like cooked greens, like cooked spinach or a cup of cooked kale or a cup of broccoli, you're getting a big load of vitamin K every day. And that's awesome. It's really good for your arteries. K, that's K1 from vegetable plants. K2 is a fer, it comes from fermented foods like fermented soy food or fermented cheeses. And um, it's hard to actually get enough K2 from food to make a difference. But K2 is more potent. It has the same activity as K1 in that it helps stimulate bones to hang on to calcium. And it tells arteries not to put calcium in the arteries. So that's really good. And it's uh, you know quite a bit more potent than K1. So if you were gonna take a supplement for either enhancing your bone or for preventing calcification in your arteries, then it would make sense to get some, I always look at a blend of maybe an equal mixture of 200 of K1, 200 of K2, somewhere in the age of 200 to 500 micrograms a day of vitamin K. And I'd like half of that to be K2 because it's more potent. I like the idea of mixing them because we have both in the environment. But as a supplement, that's certainly out there. And then there's some studies in Japan where they use huge doses, you know, 100 times that dose for os people with osteoporosis, severe bane, bre um, bone loss who can't tolerate medications. Um, so that's a, but that's a more of a theoretical application. Um, but yes, yeah, so K2 is very beneficial for bone and arteries. And I do recommend everybody get K2 every some form of vitamin K every day. The easiest way is probably a cup of cooked greens every day and you met your needs for vitamin K. Okay. All right. And all right, Susan Brandt. And okay, Susan, um, I'm glad you're asking about any new research to lower vitamin um, L LP little a, lipoprotein little a, because there's several people. I have one, two, three, I've got three other people who put in email questions about LP little a. So I'm, if you hadn't asked, I was going to come to that. So that's great. Um, so first, lipoprotein little a is a form of like LDL cholesterol, low density lipoprotein that normally a cholesterol is like a bubble and it carries nutrients from your gut to your cells like vitamin D, vitamin K. You know, it carries nutrients, fat soluble nutrients. It's the delivery truck. But there's this form of LDL cholesterol called lipoprotein A that's little. It's a little bubble, tiny bubble. It easily gets into the lining of your arteries. It's inflammatory, and it makes you more likely to clot. So it makes your blood sticky, and it pr promotes plaque growth. And, you and if you have L elevated LP little a, it's genetically related. Very few things make any difference in um, with supplements or diet. You might be able to change it by five to 10%, but if your levels are really high, that's not gonna make a big difference. But okay, so 8% of the population has high LP little a, lipoprotein A. Um, but here's the good news. If you do everything right, at least from the data I've looked at and studies I followed and from my clinic, and I also personally, I have high levels of lipoprotein A, lipopro LP little a. Um, it doesn't seem to matter that I've helped hundreds of people with very high LP little a levels shrink their plaque and stop growing plaque. So yes, LP little a increase your risk for plaque growth. But if you eat really well, you meet your nutrient needs, you're active and you manage your stress and you track your artery plaque over time, I can actually, I can show you hundred examples of people with high LP little a who shrunk their plaque. So you can offset it without even, I wouldn't even keep measuring it. I think it's an important risk factor. Anybody with a family history of heart disease should know if they have it or not. If you have cardiovascular disease, you should know. 
Um, it means you're more likely to clot, you're more likely to grow plaque. And if you're an average American, you'll win the plaque growing contest because average Americans are growing lots of plaque. But the good news is that if you do everything right, it seems far less important. I know doing everything right can be a challenge, but if you do have this factor, this genetic factor, yes, you could try taking some supplements, um, carnitine, um, hormone therapy that might lower at a tiny percentage, but I don't think that's going to clinically make much difference. What would make a big difference, which was if you followed my heart tune-up program, um, same really program that would benefit you as smart fat um, solution uh, or the um, better brain solution, any of those three books and programs I've written are all designed to decrease your risk for cardiovascular disease, give you all the tools to do that, and that's going to offset um, any risk. So my goal um, is with people with LP little a is you're not going to lower it a great deal, whether you use carnitine or hormone therapy or anything else, but you can make it so it doesn't matter. And I think it's more important for you to doing a study like a, like the recent blog I wrote last month, like should you be measuring a carotid IMT and measuring your artery plaque growth? I think if you have this vector, yes, it's more important that you should identify that. And you should be able to confirm that over time, after a year or two, your plaque shrinking or at least not growing. And if you're able to do that, to me, that's the most important thing. Let me look at a, um, here's a, another question I had on this. I know that hormone replacement therapy is beneficial for women with to lower um, LP little a. Um, yes, but if you're on est and like topical estradiol and you take um, progesterone, like 100 milligrams of progesterone at bedtime, yes, again, that could help your LP little a by a couple percentage points, but not in a significant way. Um, and then you asked, this person asked about thyroid replacement. And yes, the, um, if your thyroid's really low, that could, that does raise your cholesterol and probably does raise your LP little a. So Anybody with elevated cholesterol and elevated LP little a should make sure that their thyroid is at the right functioning level because low thyroid can make it worse. Um, the other one I had, look, had here was, can LP little a, this is Joe's question, can LP little a be a reason for failure to achieve reduction in arterial plaque? Well, yes. Um, if you have elevated LP little a, Joe, it's going to increase your risk to grow plaque. So you have to do everything else right to offset that. And um, yes, you can still shrink your plaque by 10 years if you've got very high LP little a. And, but again, it's the same program I've been sharing with you for years. Eat the right foods, meet your nutrient needs, be active and get fit, manage your stress. And if you do those four things right, I'm going to say um, I have yet to meet a patient who can't shrink their plaque with high LP little a doing those things. Um, so I hope that's reassuring for you guys out there. Please ask more questions on this if you like, but I think those are the key points I wanted to share. Okay, Rohan, hi Rohan. How do you feel about Bulletproof Coffee and brain health? Well, um, Dave, asked, I've known Dave Asprey for years and I've drank his, he's made his coffee for me several times. So I actually, I know what it's like to get a cup of coffee from Dave and it's pretty good, I like it. Um, but it's a lot to me. <laughs> Um, that's a lot of work to make. And I do appreciate the fact that it's mold free because definitely there are people out there who are very mold, mildew sensitive. Uh, molds can make toxins. So the most important part about Bulletproof Coffee is not that Dave put butter and MCT oil in it. It's that it's mold free for people who have mold allergies and don't tolerate mold toxins. So that's number one. So if you are um, allergic to molds, and you're drinking coffee, you don't feel good, either stop drinking coffee or try um, Bulletproof coffee because they're really doing a process that keeps it from growing mold and you know relatively mold-free compared to regular commercial coffee. Second, um, it's got MCT oil in it. And as I mentioned in the beginning of this, that C8, specifically the C8 um, medium chain triglyceride, is something the brain can use as fuel. So MCT oil is an alternative form of fuel for your brain that you can use when you're in a fasting state. So to really benefit, what you do is what I call partial intermittent fasting. You would stop eating at eight or nine o'clock at night and you don't eat till noon the next day, which 
you might be hungry. So I'm, I've been doing this recently about two or three days a week and I feel great. I can go work out, doesn't bother me a bit. Um, I actually feel maybe a little mentally sharper now that I've gotten used to it, I kind of like it. So that partial intermittent fasting um, helps you burn fat, make ketones, and your brain is using those ketones. You're teaching your brain to use ketones as fuel, including these C8 chains that are in bullet tape proof coffee. So that's a kind of cool thing. I, I kind of like that idea. The butter, um, well, one, butter, if you're dairy intolerant, butter has, you know, it's not dairy free. Um, if you do ghee, you took out the, the, the dairy protein, and that is pretty close to dairy free when you do ghee, clarified butter. So I would always say clarified butter. But as Dave and I have discussed, um, butter makes it foam. So if you want that cappuccino foam on your coffee and you can't use ghee, you need that little protein to do it. I don't think there's any benefit really to that butter being in it. It's a it's a decent dose of saturated fat. It's, I think of it as neutral. Um, yes, it gives you some butyrate, but you can certainly get that from other food sources. So the butter I think is a nice texture in your mouth. It feels good. It's kind of neutral. The um, MCT oil with that, especially C8 focus, C8 is really the chain size you want. You don't want regular MCT, you really want the C8 specific type. And um, mold free along with a partial fast. Okay, if you put all that together, I think that's great, Rohan. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, but put all those things in together. And I think you'd be just as well off if you wanted to. Um, you could just get matcha tea and drink moldful matcha tea. It's a lot easier to do and it's a lot easier to prepare. So there's my thoughts on that. All right. What? So Kathy wanted to ask me about what about atenolol? What do I think of atenolol? Atenolol is a beta blocker drug that can help prevent cardiac arrhythmias like palpitations and it lowers blood pressure. And um, especially, I tend to, the only time I would use atenolol is for someone who's already had a heart attack or someone who has really bad palpitations and they really seem to help. So if you've had a heart attack, that means there's a scar in your heart. You're at risk of, for a lifetime, life-threatening cardiac arrhythmias, weird heart rhythms that can end your life. And by taking atenolol, it helps block and prevent those. So anybody who's had a heart attack, I'd probably put them on a tenolol and I, or metoprolol, and I'd be using like a low dose, like you said, 25 milligrams a day. But let's look at the side effect of this drug class. If you're using it for blood pressure or something else, I'm really hesitant. I almost never use it to lower blood pressure, and here's why. Um, let's talk about the side effect profile of beta blockers in general. Number one, they cause weight gain. They decrease your ability to burn fat. Average person on a beta blocker gains five pounds of fat. Okay, that's not so great. I would not recommend that unless you had a heart attack. They can cause depression, mental confusion. Um, I don't want to make people depressed, and that's pretty common. They make asthma worse, so you would wheeze. Um, they decrease your exercise performance, so and they and they can cause erectile dysfunction, especially for, you know obviously for guys. Um, so erectile dysfunction, weight gain, fatigue, depression. Are you kidding? Um, it's not my favorite drug. None of the beta blockers I really like, but I still use them. And someone who has really serious palpitations, a cardiac arrhythmias, or someone who's had a heart attack, I usually try to use the lowest dose. It would give them that heart attack um, scar prevention, which is about 25 milligrams a day. And um, that's what I think about atenolol. I hope that answers your question. How about, let's see, Michelle here. Hey, from upstate New York farm country. Yes, hi, Michelle. I'm glad you're here listening. Oh, Mariana had another question on K2. You take it with vitamin D and magnesium, what dose? Um, okay, so K2, again, I'm, as I mentioned before, I'm looking at 100, 200 micrograms per day. That's the dose I would usually use in a supplement. Um, sometimes a much higher dose, but then I'd really want you to have sit down with the doctor and talk about all your options. And then yes, for it to really have the benefit for your bones, not only do you need vitamin K, but you need, so here's my four nutrients that are key for your bones. Vitamin D, vitamin K, calcium and magnesium. So I mentioned the dose for vitamin D. 
uh, I'm excuse me, I mentioned the dose for vitamin K. For vitamin D, I'd always like you to get at least 2,000 international units a day. That's the minimum, and you might need up to 5,000 a day every day long term. Um, and your, your blood level with that should be in the 50 to 60 range if you've been on it for taking it every day for three months. That's what your blood level should be. So that's how much vitamin D you need. Calcium, I really wish people would get their calcium for food and not focus on a supplement. I think the health data for food sources is better. And the best sources aren't like dairy. The best sources are like nuts and green leafies. So broccoli, kale, great 100 milligrams per cup. Um, your goal is to get 800 to 1,000 milligrams of calcium every day. And you should be able to do that from food. And there's actually, in all, in all the, the more recent books I've written, Heart Tune Up, um, Smart Fat, um, they give you food tables and you can calculate how much calcium you're getting from food and what foods to have, like almonds have it or salmon. Have, you can get it from eating wild salmon. So, all right. Um, and magnesium is the other nutrient. And I'm always looking for a minimum of 400, preferably 600 milligrams of magnesium a day. And also in those books, like Better Brain Solution, you can see how to calculate your magnesium from food and how much supplement to add. And I give you all those tools in there to do that. Um, Carrie, well, thank you for tuning in. And Kathy, glu I'm not Kathy, glucoclosi. I'm not sure what that means. Um, all right. Mariana, you asked about vitamin B12 and whether it's methylated or not. So there's methylcobalamin and there's like cyanocobalamin and in height, cyano is like cyanide, but you don't, you know, it's a trace, tiny amount, not really toxic. So um, people sometimes make a big deal out of methylcobalamin or cyanocobalamin. I don't think you're going to get enough cyanide really from it to make a difference. But methyl groups are really good for you. So my preference is always methyl anything just about because most people aren't getting enough methyl groups and methyl helps your DNA repair. So methylcobalamin is the form I like. And the key is that you have a good level and people need different amounts of vitamin B12. I usually think of, in a, I'd like everybody to get a supplement with 100 to 500 micrograms a day. Um, and your level should be above 500, you know, so we say 300 is like low, but some people even at 400 have intracellular B12 deficiency, can have neurologic harm. So I'm usually aiming for more than 500, up to 800 to 1,000 would be ideal, and you don't really overdose on it. If your levels are higher, you know, over 1,000, it's not that big a deal, as long as you're not folate deficient at the same time another B vitamin. So I want you to get like in a good multi, you'd be getting folate, mixed folates, B12 together, methyl B12 would be on the way I would want to go. Um, Tina is asking about magnesium and Mariana is what from this? Um, what is best to use your stomach? The worst form of magnesium would be magnesium oxide because it's a GI irritant. It can bother your stomach. It can cause crampy abdominal stuff. We used to use magnesium oxide back in the 1980s when I was an intern um, in medical school and interning and in residency. We used, I used magnesium oxide to clean someone out before they had a colonoscopy. And it was kind of harsh, not really pleasant. I always apologized before I gave it to people. And um, yuck, I mean, that's kind of, that is just too, you don't want a bowel prep every day. You want something that's well tolerated. And the best forms of calcium, um, a step up would be magnesium citrate. Easier on your stomach, um, somewhat nice for helping people with constipation, um, but the best absorbed, if you really want to absorb magnesium, that's the whole point, you'd like it to be protein bound. And forms of, Magnesium that are protein bound or magnesium malate, magnesium glycinate, chelated form. So we use the magnesium from Designs from Health, and that's what we offer on our website. And I think it's really well tolerated. As I've said um, this evening, it helps you sleep, helps your blood pressure, helps your blood sugar, um, helps prevent migraines, muscle cramps. Um, it's really great. So that's the kind of magnesium I would recommend um, and what I would avoid. Um, Kathy, you're asking about low carb diets. I'm not specific. So low carb, I'm not, I'm not asking anyone to be low carb. I'm asking them to eat the right carbs. 
Uh, low carb to me means if you're really going very low carb, you don't get beans, you don't get, you have to cut out your green leafies, you can't have berries. So you could avoid refined carbs. That's really my goal in life is to say, get rid of the sugar, get rid of the refined carbs. I would, have, I would avoid most grains, although I'm okay with a little wild rice, a little still cut oatmeal. Um, but I would avoid most of the grains. I'd certainly be getting most of the gluten wheat products. And um, I'd be relatively low carb, as in good carbs from vegetable, fruit, beans, nuts. Those are great carbs. Those are, well, nuts are more fat, have some carbohydrate, but they're more fat. So um, vegetable, fruit, and beans. So the vegetables I exclude that have a high glycemic load that are thinking of high carb would be potatoes. And the only fruit that is, there's no fruit that has a high um, glycemic load to it, but bananas are medium, so I tend to limit banana intake. But that's about it. Eat more vegetables and fruits, live it up, have more of those carbs like berries and green leafies, very low sugar load with those. And I wouldn't worry about being low carb, but I would want the right carbs, the right fat, and the right protein. I think that's really what the, the, the difference is. Ariana, um, you're saying, it, is, it, is it very hard to get K? No, I don't think it's hard to get K if you eat green leafies. So if you have a cup of broccoli a day, that's like 650 micrograms. I mean, that's great. If you eat a cup of kale, 1,000. I mean, it's pretty easy if you eat greens, cooked spinach, like 850. So if you're willing to eat green leafies, you can get all the vitamin K you need. To get vitamin K2, that's kind of challenging with food. I mean, natto is like fermented soy. Most people don't like it. Um, some of these really smelly fermented cheeses have a little bit, not very much. If you want K2, you need to get it from a supplement. So that could be hard, but not easy to do in just a good multivitamin. Hi, Helen. I'm glad you're here. Um, Marianne is also asking about the lipoprotein. We talked about lipoprotein A earlier on the program. If you missed the beginning, please re-listen to the whole thing so you can tune in for that. But um, on a, it's not on a regular cholesterol profile. You'd have to do like an advanced lipid profile. We use NMR, um, nuclear magnetic, magne, magnetic resonance, to look at the different particle sizes and types of cholesterol bubbles you've got. That's the really specific form that's really helpful. But I'd like everyone with a bad family history or high risk um, factors or established cardiovascular disease, I'd like to see an advanced lipid profile. And it should include an um, LP little a, lipoprotein A in it. So that's what you'd have to do to get that measured. Um, Gail's asking if nature throid increases heart disease. Um, nat natural thyroid products, as long as you're treating yourself normally. Um, here's the risk with thyroid medication. People who take too much medication, whether it's a natural porcine um, pig-related thyroid gland or a synthetic form like levothyroxine, if and you take too much of any of those, you can have palpitations, arrhythmias, there's cardiac risk to that. Um, I don't see any risk to having normal um, euthyroid status. And I'd like wish many people have low thyroid and don't know it. So probably more people than we realize are uh, not diagnosed. They have low thyroid function. Um, and oftentimes synthetic meds only give you one form of thyroid, T4, which may not convert to the more active forms. And there's an advantage for many people to use a natural form of thyroid therapy that's got mixed forms. So, but no, I don't think they're gonna cause heart disease unless you are totally over-treated. Um, Sandra, you're asking, what is partial intermittent fasting? So partial intermittent fasting means you fast once in a while, like two to three days a week. And I actually spoke a lot about that in my Better Brain Solution. So if you haven't read that book, please read it. It's awesome. It goes through the foods you need, um, supplements, activities, how to give you a better brain. And in partial intermittent fasting is a trick, a tool to help improve brain function. It's getting your brain to use ketones um, a few days a week and changing up its fuel supply. So partial intermittent fasting means that two or three days a week, you don't eat anything, you fast, say at nine o'clock, and you don't eat any carbs at all until like noon the next day, so 15 hours. And then 
when your body starts running out of glycogen and energy, it'll start burning fat and you'll make ketones for fuel and that's the energy your brain will use um, by mid morning to late morning. So that's um, partial intermittent fasting is, should help with blood sugar control, can help you lose weight. And for some people it can help mental clarity. So I don't think you have to do it every day. Actually, I don't even want you to do it every day. I don't want you to be in ketosis all the time. But I think a couple days a week is really beneficial. That's why it's called intermittent, partial. You don't fast all day. You just fast while you're asleep, plus like three extra, four, a few extra hours. Um, and that, that's, there you go. So I hope that's helpful. Um, Sandra said, does HWC break a fast? Sorry, Sandra, I don't know what HWC is. That'll probably be obvious self obvious when you tell me, but post that back up there and I'll come back to it. Hi, Ann, I'm glad you're here. Sandra, pause. Um, calcium blockers. Okay, what about calcium channel blockers? Calcium channel blockers can be used to um, decrease some cardiac arrhythmias, but more commonly they're used for lowering blood pressure. Um, of the blood pressure medications out there, they're not in my top, of the top two or three classes, uh, not really mine. I much prefer things that improve the function of your arteries and make them function better. And calcium channel blockers are like, they lower blood pressure numbers. Um, I think when you look at, does it help save lives, um, get people out of heart failure, improve your cardiac function? I think ACE inhibitors, ARBs, that's a better class than calcium channel blockers. But my goal is you wouldn't need any of these. If you really followed my program and you ate well, you met your nutrient needs, you got fit, you manage your stress, you avoided toxins. If you're following the protocols I've been trying to teach for years, my hope is you wouldn't need a calcium channel blocker or any of these medications. Okay, Angel, I'm glad you're here. Thanks for coming in and showing up. Um, fish oil dosage in which brand? Okay, Kathy, I think you might've missed the beginning, but I think somewhere in there I was talking about if you're a vegetarian and you're looking for a source of long chain omega-3, we're looking at about four to 500 milligrams of seaweed D8 extract with DHA every day. And for, if you're willing to eat um, seafood, I think easier, less expensive is getting it from fish oil. As long as it's, you know, good quality is the key. And you're looking for a thousand milligrams of a fish oil with um, DHA and EPA in it. So look at the ingredients should be a, not a thousand milligrams of total omega-3, but add it up, a thousand milligrams of EPA and DHA. And then the quality really depends, is it rancid or not? Has it gone bad? Um, you can taste it, just a drop, one drop, taste it on your tongue. It should taste pleasant, like good quality seafood. And if it tastes like yuck, then forget it. It's bad quality, it's rancid, throw it out. I'm asked for your money back. And, um, up there, you can see if you're looking for a magnesium product, it's there. And Kim, maybe you could post up some uh, fish oil, um, some links for them to look at as well. So if they were looking for that. What about, Kathy wants to know, what about apple cider vinegar? Well, all vinegar has some acidity to it and it improves your digestion. And when you put vinegar like on your salad with olive oil and vinegar, you actually improve your blood sugar control and you um, improve your digestion. So I think it's great to have with food. That's why I think like Italian dressing is like awesome to start your meal with that. So I'm always happy about you using vinegar, whether it's balsamic has more sugar in it. So I like the right of red wine vinegar, apple cider vinegar, any of those I'm okay with. Um, you, I'm, it's kind of a flavor preference from my perspective. Other people might feel more strongly otherwise, but I'm thinking of most vinegars are good for you to have with food, um, red wine vinegar, balsamic vinegar, apple cider vinegar, you choose, any of those work for me. Okay. Um, Kathy again, with a, I, I'm, that looks like a picture of your poodle. Um, pretty cute dog you have, Kathy. Um, so 
pharmacies do not have K2. No, you don't get it from, you get it from a nutraceutical, like the, the multivitamin we offer has K2 in it. The fish oil that we provide from um, Designs for Health, this omega-3 avail, comes with vitamin D, a thousand um, international units, and um, vitamin K, uh, and, and vitamin K. So you can get it in supplement form. And there's even a high dose liquid form of K2. Um, but again, I'm only gonna recommend you could have to talk to your doctor. You would not be using that on your own. But I think you would benefit from using a multivitamin that has 100 to 200 micrograms of K1 and K2, both of them, every day. And that's what we provide with our um, uh, multivitamin um, supplements. Kathy, I also want to know about CoQ10. Um, CoQ10 is something that helps your body make energy. CoQ10 is a molecule, a big molecule, that transport electrons into your mitochondria to be burned as fuel. It's kind of like on the old steamships, there was a guy down there, could have been a woman, but you see a guy shoveling coal into the fire. That person shoveling coal is like CoQ10. They're transporting electrons into the furnace to burn his energy. And um, there's, in, you know, in theory, if you had more CoQ10, you'd, have, you'd be able to make more energy. Um, here's the reality, though. None of the studies have really showed any groundbreaking work with CoQ10. I used to be fascinated by it, but I've been a little disappointed over time. There are some um, benefits shown, for one, um, Parkinson's, about the only treatment out there on the planet today that seems to slow the progression of Parkinson's is CoQ10. It helps protect your brain. So anybody with early, moderate Parkinson's should be on a high-dose CoQ10 supplement. Um, the most common reason I recommend it to my patients is for those people who or on a statin medication. Because if you take a cholesterol only in statins, it lowers your CoQ10 levels about 20%. And if I was to give you 100 milligrams of CoQ10 every day of a good absorbed form, that would bring your levels back to normal, which I would like to keep them. Now, CoQ10 has huge difference in absorption. When you buy the powder tablets, um, powder that gets formed into a tablet, you absorb maybe one to two percent of that, not very much. Liquid and oil, those gel caps for CoQ10, you might absorb two to four percent. And some forms, special forms like the one I use from Designs for Health is probably eight or ten percent absorption. So you actually can save money by spending more on a better CoQ10 product because you absorb more of it. The whole point is to get into your blood, not to just go right through your gastrointestinal tract. So quality really makes a difference. I would use it for anyone with neurologic disease, anyone with heart failure, I use CoQ10, and anyone on a statin medication. That's when I personally use it. Um, Sandra Cohen, you mentioned heavy cream. What about it? Well, you could use, the only time I look at heavy cream is like if you're trying to do coffee and a partial intermittent fast, you don't want to add milk to it. If you don't like, if you can't eat, drink your coffee black, on those two days a week, you do a partial um, intermittent fast, you could put a little tablespoon of whole cream in there to give it some um, sustenance without carbs. It's heavy cream is really low in carbohydrates. So that's a fat you can add instead of MCT oil, where you need a blender, you need, literally need to put it in a blender to get it to, to blend, blend up. Um, you could use heavy cream, a tablespoon, on the day you're doing a par partial intermittent fast to make your coffee more palatable. Um, that's certainly the only time I would really recommend using it, unless it was a holiday and you were doing something special like whipping cream, um, but I wouldn't use that regularly. Um, Kathy, I, you asked where do you get K210. I'm going to have Kim um, reach out to you offline and give you a link um, for that. But again, I always talk to your doctor about taking CoQ10 um, and for more details. And again, it's in the supplements we offer on our website. Okay, Marlene. Now, John, this is intriguing. I've learned so much for you. I actually babysit your 60s back in the 1960s. Well, um, Marlene, I, 4th of July weekend, I was with my sisters. I went out to see, I flew from Florida back to where I'm from, the 
Puget Sound area around Seattle. And I was seen, I spent on the Hood Canal um, several days. I went to see my dad. I went to see, I saw my mom. And my sister and I were hanging out. So, wow, thank you for babysitting my sisters. Um, this is a small world when you think about it. That's pretty cool. Sandra, what do I think about exogenous keto supplement? I don't have much thought. Sorry, I'm not um, exogenous ketos. So you can, there are some keto salts you can take. They're pretty expensive. So instead of fasting to get your ketones up, you can take these salts. Um, I don't think there's anything proven on them yet. Oh, it's intriguing. The idea that you could fuel your brain. Um, and it may be that they have some mild cognitive benefit, but I'm still waiting to see more about that for now. I think there's more benefit to fasting than just making ketones. I think it does several other things that are really beneficial. And I'm not convinced that just taking a ketone um, salt would be as beneficial as fasting to make ketones because, again, fasting has other beneficial physiologic activities. So I'm, I'm not pushing the exogenous ketones at this time. All right, we're a little past seven. I'm gonna go on for, we're almost to the end of these questions and these have been really great. Um, let me just look at, before I go any further, anybody else who had one, I was really um, compelled to answer that was written in here. Do I recommend niacin, like especially time release? I used to recommend niacin years ago because it helped your lipid profile by making your HDL bigger and your LDL bigger. I was talking about um, lipoprotein and uh, sizes and how bigger is better than little. Um, but they've never been shown in clinical studies to decrease your risk for plaque growth, and they've never been shown to help prevent cardiovascular events. It has a lot of side effects. So I stopped using niacin because even though they made your cholesterol profile look better, they didn't have any proven clinical benefits. So that was a good question. Um, I'm glad you asked that. And then Virginia wanted to ask about managing cholesterol without statins, and that's like our next question on here. Um, how do I feel about the statin epidemic? Well, the statin epidemic refers to that, I mean, some cardiologists want to put it in the water. So there's this huge, oh, I think, overuse of statin medications. Um, statin meds, what do they do? They lower your cholesterol, uh, probably about 30% or more. They decrease the stickiness of your blood. Okay, that actually might be more beneficial in decreasing your cholesterol. And they lower inflammation in your artery. And lowering inflammation is good. So much of the benefit from a statin cholesterol-lowering med may not be that it lowers cholesterol. It may be that they decrease inflammation and blood stickiness. And for people who've had a heart attack or stroke, especially guys, the data clearly shows the statins are more effective for men than they are for women. Women benefit more from lifestyle changes. Men have some mild benefit from statins. So um, if you have heart disease, if you're super high risk and your cholesterol is high, I, I, I'm not adverse to starting someone on a statin med, but they have a lot of side effects. They cause memory loss, your blood sugar goes up, muscle pain, liver inflammation, and they lower your testosterone levels. So they have oodles of side effects, but they are indicated. I'm not putting them in the water supply, no matter who, I think people who say that are crazy. Um, but they do, for certain people with heart disease, they could probably be life-saving, especially some people have cholesterol levels of 500. Okay, that could be essential for that rare one in 100 person um, out there. But for most people, I don't think we need more of them. I think we need, we can prevent 90% of cardiovascular disease, heart attacks and strokes with lifestyle. If we were to, if everybody did everything right, 90% of people who are on statins wouldn't need them. Um, I think we're way overusing them. Hence that term um, epidemic, I think is actually pretty accurate. Lynn, you're saying you can't have vitamin D due to high calcium levels. Now what? If you have high calcium levels, all right, um, rarely that could be cancer, hopefully not to talk to your doctor. Much more likely would be that you have parathyroid hormone elevations and you need to have that treated. And there are a, there's an easy surgical procedure for people with a parathyroid adenoma. It's a benign tumor that produces um, parathyroid hormone, which 
weakens your bones and raises your calcium. So hopefully, obviously, this is a serious issue. You need to talk to your doctor, find out what's causing your high calcium level. Is it high parathyroid hormone levels? And if so, get that treated. And then you should be able to take vitamin D after that. Um, but that's you're asking a really complicated question. Uh, Mary, how do you strengthen vein lining? I don't know how to, sadly, I don't know how to strengthen vein lining. Exercise is really good for your veins. It helps pump them. But once they weaken and you have big varicose veins, I don't have a solution for that. I would look at injections or, um, you know, uh, laser therapy. Okay. All right, and Marlene, yes, um, I, I was just on the canal last weekend. I think um, that's about it, folks. I think I got to most of our written questions. Um, we're a little over our time, so I don't want to keep you longer. Those were, I thank everybody for tuning in. It was really fun. Oh, I do have a little announcement for next week. I'm really excited about this. We're, off, we're going to be offering an amazing Outsmart Aging package. We're taking our former um, PBS program um, that we offered um, digital material on DVDs, CDs, a workbook, um, shopping lists, uh, really cool, terrific material. And we're now able to offer that directly to you, but at 75% discounts. So we're taking the former price slashing it. And I'm going to be sending you an email and information on that next week um, on my blog. So stay tuned. Um, more information coming on that. But I want to give you all the tools and the tricks to help you out smart aging to feel fantastic and feel great. Um, and that's coming to you soon next week. I'm Dr. Stephen Masley. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, thanks, everybody.